Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Frank Baker, for the record. Um, City Council for District 3. I'm the chair of the Boston City Council Committee on Planning, Development, and Transportation. I want to remind you that this is a public hearing being recorded and broadcast live on Xfinity 8, RCN 82, Fios 964, and streamed on www.boston.gov slash city dash council dash TV. Please silence your cell phones. Um, I do not see anyone signed up for public testimony, but we will take public testimony at the end. Today's hearing is on docket number 0191. <clears throat> this matter is sponsored by Kenzie Bach of District 8. It was referred to Committee on Planning, Development, Transportation on January 26th, 2022. Um, an order for a hearing regarding zoning relief for affordable, affordable projects. Um, with that, I'd like to acknowledge a council from District 8, Kenzie Bach, and the council from District 9, uh, Liz Braden. Uh, good morning, everybody, and do you want to do opening remarks? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'll turn it over to Kenzie for her opening remarks. Uh, thank you. Kenzie, uh, Th Council Bach, you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you to the administration for being here today. Um, this, uh, we're, we're really excited. This hearing, um, it's jumping off of some work that we did in the last session, uh, and we actually had a, um, a hearing here in March 2021 talking about options for uh, expediting affordable housing developments so that we can get more affordable units built in the city. Um, for councilors, I've provided the memo from that hearing back in March 2021 so folks can see it. And for reference, one of the first things on our list at the time was parking relief, um, lifting parking minimums for majority affordable projects. And I was so glad that that was something the council passed unanimously last year and was signed by the mayor, one of the first things she signed actually. Um, and, uh, and then so we kind of refiled this um, in January, hoping to continue to work on that agenda, and so was very pleased to see the Wu administration sign an executive order a couple of months back, um, calling for you know all of the departments to work together to expedite affordable housing development. Um, and I know that the the sort of review assessment of like what that's going to look like, what it caches out into, is ongoing. Um, and so we really called this hearing today um, not as a way to try to force the administration to make announcements before it's ready, but more as a chance to make sure that while we're in this period of, of surveying and thinking about this, that there's a chance for counselors, administration members, members of the public, advocates um, from organizations like Abundant Housing MA and Housing Forward to kind of get on the table some of these um, options that, uh, that we're interested in and excited about so that we can kind of use the window created by the executive order to, to the best of our ability. Um, because, you know, I just think that Affordable housing is one of those things where we can set targets and say this is the need in the city and fundamentally the question for those of us in City Hall has to be like, well, how do we get there from here? Um, and how do we actually, you know, make sure that we have processes where where just every project gets a bit easier because I think that's the other thing is it's easy to identify one or two projects and throw all of our like shoulders into making them happen. But I think that one of the things that's been most encouraging to me since we passed the affordable um, housing, the parking minimums relief, is that on several occasions I've talked to folks who are just thinking about projects differently and thinking about their ability to propose things um, that they wouldn't have before. And so, and so for me, that's like the big thing here is that to have a city where we're building housing for all, um, we really need to just find as many ways as possible to let everybody's creativity tackle this problem together. Um, and so I'm excited to see what we can work on next here and grateful to the um, BPDA and the Mayor's Office of Housing and uh, the BHA for being here with us today. Thank you so much, Mr. Thank Chair. You, Council. Council Braden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here this morning, and thank you to Councillor Bach for um, bringing forward this hearing, uh, hearing order. Um, you know, housing affordability is the hugest, the biggest challenge we have, um, and I'm a tremendous advocate for mixed, um, mixed income housing in, in any, any which way we can do it, but we still have that need for the more deeply affordable units and then the a spectrum of affordability that will meet the needs. And we sort of have an inverse, we're building way more uh, uh, market rate housing than we're building of affordable, and it's totally out of, out of, out of uh, sync with what we really need. So I'm really excited to hear the conversation this morning and hear what ideas folks have and uh, see how we can help the situation with regard to housing that folks can afford. 
thank you for being here. Thank you. With that, I don't know who wants to start. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning uh, to the Chair, Councillor Baker, Councillor Bach, and, and members of the committee. My name is Jessica Boatwright, and I am the Deputy Director for Neighborhood Housing Development in the Mayor's Office of Housing. I'm here today uh, with colleagues from, from my office, um, Dan Lesser, the Director of Operations in the Mayor's Office of Housing, and Nolan Green, the Director of Innovation and Technology, as well as the BPDA and um, Boston Housing Authority. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss our opportunity to deploy new tools in support of making Boston an affordable home for all. I'm really proud of the work that the Mayor's Office of Housing does in partnership with the agencies who are at the table with us today, with your offices, the development community, and the residents of Boston to create affordable housing. Boston is a national leader with over 20% of our housing stock um, income restricted as affordable housing. In 2021, we set a record-breaking uh, 1,033 permits for new affordable housing units, and this year we are on track to outpace that number. Uh, but as we've talked about this morning and many times before, this work is not enough. Half of all renters and 28% of all homeowners in Boston are considered cost burden, which means that they pay more than 30% of their income every month on their housing costs. Residents can wait years on waiting lists for an opportunity to rent or buy an affordable housing unit. As, as uh, Councillor Bach mentioned, and as the council recognized in 2021, the council's order to amend parking minimums for affordable housing um, was a really important measure and recognized that the current processes and procedures that we have leave too much room for hiccups in the trajectory from a strong project idea to giving someone a key to their new home. The permanent supportive housing project at 3368 Washington Street which is currently under construction, building 202 new homes, um, took 917 days from when it initially filed um, until they actually obtained their permit, building permit. Between 2013 and 2019, of the 35 affordable housing projects subject to Article 80 review, six of them took more than two years to complete the Article 80 approval process, and many took much longer to receive their building permits. These extended timeframes are not only frustrating and inefficient. Extended time spent in an approval process means developers eager to address our housing crisis cannot engage in additional projects. It means that already funded projects request additional funds that should go to new projects, or that projects lose out on state funding awards while they wait to complete our approval processes. It can also mean neighborhoods wait extended periods of time for the transformation of blighted or empty properties into affordable housing. And most importantly, it means longer waits for housing stability for our residents. The expedited processes we are discussing today will have broad and meaningful impacts. I'm now gonna turn it over to my colleague, Dan Lesser, who's going to outline the work of Mayor Wu's executive order. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you to Councilor Baker, Councilor Bach, and committee members for inviting us to be part of this important discussion. As Jessica said, my name is Dan Lesser. I'm the Director of Operations for the Mayor's Office of Housing. Building on Jessica's important context, we'd like to give you a brief update on our progress towards implementing the Mayor's Executive Order to, to accelerate the production of affordable housing. The order instructs all relevant city agencies to work together to decrease the approval time for affordable housing projects by 50%. To do that, the order has five main components. First, prioritizing affordable housing in the review process and, and analyzing opportunities to improve the current process. Second, creating a new path for affordable housing within the Article 80 process. Three, studying and addressing zoning challenges for affordable housing. Fourth, creating a new coordinated tracking system for affordable housing reviews and approvals. And fifth, establishing a governance structure for implementation of this order. Since the order was signed on October 6, we have created an interagency steering committee that meets weekly to oversee the implementation and dedicated working groups assigned, each part, assigned to each part of the order. We are currently in the process of meeting with all the relevant departments and agencies to discuss the process for prioritizing affordable housing and identifying areas where the process could be streamlined. I'm happy but not surprised to share that all of the partner agencies are eager to work towards implementing um, the executive order, and they definitely see the opportunity and the challenges we're against. 
We are also doing a deep dive into different systems to use to track the various approval processes connected to affordable housing development. I'll pass it to my colleague, Devin Quirk. Quirk. <laughs> I've known Devin for years. I don't know. Apologies, Devin. No worries. Um, to to uh, give an update on the BP Day's work. Thanks, Dan. Um, good morning, everyone. For the record, I'm Devin Quirk, um, the Deputy Chief of Development and Transformation at the BPDA, and I also want to thank the Council for making time for this important conversation today. Mayor Wu has charged our staff at the BPDA to transform the agency um, in our fight to make the city more resilient, more, more affordable, and ultimately more equitable uh, place to live. In recent years, Boston has experienced rapid economic expansion, especially in certain sectors like life science, and this has brought many high-paying jobs to our city, broadened our tax base, and provide the city with new resources to broaden our services. But this exp expansion has also placed tremendous pressure on our housing market, and most importantly, created extreme pressures on many Bostonians to be able to afford to continue to live here. The issue is particularly acute, as this council knows, amongst, amongst communities of color uh, facing displacement, young people trying to start their careers in our city, and also among our essential workers that form the backbone of our economy. It's within that context that we're working to implement Mayor Wu's executive order. Ultimately, there are four main tools that we can uh, deploy to accelerate affordable housing production, land, funding, operational efficiencies to get units uh, completed more quickly, and changing regulatory tools to add incentives to reduce barriers to affordable housing creation. While land and funding are less the focus of today's hearing, I think it's important to say that we continue to prioritize our efforts in this space. At Mayor Wu's direction, we completed a land audit this year of public real estate that the city can bring to the table to increase affordable housing production. And we're also prioritizing efforts to acquire property off the speculative market to preserve it for affordable housing. The administration is equally committed to working with this council to bring new resources to the table for affordable housing, from significant ARPA dollars to leveraging uh, private development in our city to create more affordable housing units. To create efficiencies in our process, we are working with colleagues across many city departments to examine the Article 80 permitting process to find areas where we can streamline and improve. Our strategies range from establishing a dedicated team to work on affordable housing permitting, to creating a separate affordable housing review process that has tight timelines and deadlines, to considering more surgical alterations to the Article 80 process that do that, the places that we can uh, eliminate uh, um, regulatory hurdles that do not provide much benefit. When it comes to zoning changes, we are currently considering all options that, that anyone would bring to us. There are certainly opportunities to require more affordable housing production through inclusionary zoning or incent private mar the private market to build more income restricted units through tools like density bonuses. In addition, we're considering what's, un what's unnecessary in re the regulatory barriers in our zoning code and, what, and what, what barriers they put in place to affordable housing creation. A great example of this, as Councillor Bach mentioned, is our work together to eliminate parking minimums for affordable housing. Historically, parking minimums triggered the need for zoning variances, and, th and those slowed down permitting processes and exposed these really important projects to legal challenges. So we're working to identify similar roadblocks in the zoning code and find ways to avoid or eliminate them. Ultimately, we believe that housing is a human right, and we will work to as we work to establish a new future for the agency, it is imperative that the BPDA do everything in its power to make Boston a more affordable place to live for Bostonians of all incomes and backgrounds. So with that, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Joe. Good morning. Um, for the record, my name is Joel Wall. I'm the Chief of Staff at the Boston Housing Authority. Um, I want to first thank the, um, the members of the council, um, the chair, sponsor, and members here, um, as well as the mayor's team on my left for their focus on accelerating the review of affordable housing projects, and as well as um, investing in public housing administered by the BHA. And we're appreciating, as, a, as an owner and manager of housing, um, the work of the uh, task force to dig deep to implement the, executive, the recently promulgated executive order. Um, I think the, the, the short, the short uh, synopsis of our position on this one is that as an owner and manager of public housing and a sponsor of multiple different kinds of partnerships, we're an eager partner in efforts to make it easier for housing that serves Boston's lowest income residents to be built and to be maintained. In partnership with Mayor Wu's team, we were thinking through scenarios where the BHA or its affiliates currently, under count, currently encounter zoning review through the Article 80 process or require zoning relief of some kind, so variances or um, other, other zoning-related processes. Um, so I'm going to give 
Um, three just kind of examples just to paint the picture of how we run into it and it's it'll be quite quick so one of the one of the areas that we are talking through with um, our colleagues at BPDA and Mayor's Office of Housing is just BHA owned um, rehabilitation projects in recent years a pathway on these has been that the BHA is transferring the legal ownership to a BHA owned affiliate so it's hundred percent publicly controlled still and we attach Section 8 vouchers to that project because it brings in more revenue that can finance a total uh, rehabilitation project. So in the case of those projects and Lower Mills or St. Batolph would be examples, we do typically go through Article 80. Um, that may be an area where there's room for operational efficiency where both BHA and BPDA staff can redirect their attention elsewhere. So we're in dialogue about that category of projects. And then you know, it, there are really a couple of other categories. One is just that we, in addition to sort of public-public um, redevelopments where we're partnering with ourselves and the city, um, we have public-private elements. I think that many of those projects, and we're thinking about like Bunker Hill or Mary Ellen McCormick, to the extent that they hit a certain level of affordability in terms of the overall percentage, they may be covered by the executive order and implicated by changes that come through the executive order. Um, so that you know, we're we're happy to do anything that can you know reduce the um, legal costs associated with the project or um, help you know accelerate the work of staff to make those projects happen. And then finally, in new construction examples where it's a BHA or city-owned parcel or 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 a private parcel where we may have some involvement. So whether it's BHA building new units, a joint venture of some kind. Um, let's say the BHA were a 51% owner, um, or if it's just even thinking about private housing that's going for project-based Section 8. Potentially any of those categories of projects will be implicated by the good work of my, the colleagues to my left and of the council. So we're really happy to engage about how projects of the kinds mentioned may be able to move more quickly towards housing um, low-income residents in Boston. And that's my testimony for today. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge Council Flynn. Council Flynn, do you have an opening statement? No, no. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Thank you, Council Flynn. And uh, I also have a letter from Brian Worrell stating he is unable to make it, and also one from Council Baruzzi Louis Jean, unable to make it here today. Um, thank you guys for coming out. What did I just do with my. Nope, 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 nope. I lost my paper. Um, so, Devin, you had talked about, I think you said, I have it written down here someplace, tools for, like you were talking about zoning and, and, and Article 80, like explain to me some of these tools because <clears throat> uh, there's nobody here from ISD and everything basically goes through ISD. They're severely, you know, understaffed and everybody knows you need plans examiners we need we need so if if all of the if all of the um, affordable projects get fast-tracked what happens to everything else yeah. so, so are we gonna look at three years of only affordable being built here or only affordable being permitted that, that's a great question, Councilor, and I appreciate that you started the, um, the question with the, with the issue of capacity, because capacity is yeah. absolutely yeah. a major part of the solution, and that's an issue in, in I think, uh, in multiple departments, not just ISD. That's something we've, we've talked about it as an issue on our own staff, too. There's a lot happening in Boston. Uh, there, there's, a lot, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of development pressure, and in some places that's good, and other places, like we're talking about here, has negative consequences, so it's important for us to be able to respond to that. Um, there, we are both looking at alternatives, paths for affordable housing that give it some prioritized attention. So yes, in some cases that would be a trade-off decision, but I think more importantly, we're looking 
for opportunities to change the process for affordable housing so it doesn't necessarily have to be a trade-off with that. With so, so less community process? Could, it could potentially be less community process or it could just, you know, the work of, on it, that, of this council on limiting parking minimums is a good example of it. If, yeah. we, if we just established that, you know, it, we, we, we took a look at what are the, I know we're actively still doing this, what are the, what are the uh, variance triggers at ISD for affordable housing? And uh, height and FAR at the top of the list, insufficient off-street uh, off parking had historically been one. That, that barrier has now been eliminated. So we can, uh, we can consider changes to the zoning code to add a little bit more height, to add a little bit more density, and to eliminate that trigger, thus taking a step out of the process. So that would be one example of how we could, and that doesn't necessarily have to come at the expense of community feedback, but in some cases, um, it will. Uh, some, but also in other cases, there are places where maybe community feedback is there's just there just isn't a lot, right? If we're if we're doing a there major, isn't a lot of community feedback. There, um, or did you say lot? There, or there, a lot? There, historically, on the issue, they may may not have been a lot. If it, an in, interior res renovation of a building to convert it from um, a market rate housing to affordable housing, mm -hmm. that, that in some cases that there might be significant community process necessary there. In other cases, there may not not be, and if it's if it's in that category, perhaps. We well, might I mean, I don't think we're, we're, I don't think com most communities are going to be concerned about existing buildings' interior renovations. They're, they're going to be concerned about here's 250 units, you know, on this that, corner here, no parking, that sort of thing, and and that that's that's real. So I'd be concerned with what the process is going to look like if 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 community is still going to have a going to have a voice. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, changing regulatory tools is yeah. what is what I wrote down. Like, so are we are we going to get into exercises where we're changing zoning code or or, or explain that to me? Changing regulatory tools. Yeah, so, um, just use this that is the same example. So, if we if we if we're seeing that um, minor. Uh, if we're looking at the variances and seeing that there's a there's a yeah. that it, it's height or it's setback or it's FAR that's creating so the, so this the is basically going to be parallel teams set up at BRA BPDA parallel teams set up at maybe at ISD if we can hire the people over there and parallel teams set up in in um, housing yes I think mean, there are, there are, I mean, want to outline there are two distinct strategies changes to the to the zoning code itself yeah. which would not which would just provide a clearer path for affordable housing would not necessarily but what are those changes you're talking about how do we provide that that's, clearer path? that's the work we're doing right now counselor so what the, the 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 data analysis we're at is looking at what are the triggers uh, that have uh, caused the need for variances uh, and do we want to change zoning? If, there, if we do want to change zoning, that will absolutely include a community process. But we're not at the place yet where we have a, a definitive answer to that because we need to look at every single affordable housing project that's been permanent mm -hmm. in recent years and look at and be able to provide a comprehensive story around that. But to, to, to respond to your comment about separate teams, yes, we do want to set up a, a, a team of staff people that are dedicated and experienced in affordable housing permitting. And are they so, going to be from existing members of BPDA, of Mayor's Office of Housing, of, and then, so not necessarily, that is their job to look at, to look at affordable housing, but um, BPDA, what does staffing yeah. look like for you guys? Now, if we're gonna now focus on all affordable, it kind of feels like, because to get over to, to Jessica's comment, that uh, I think it was two years, two years in Article mm -hmm. 80, and then, long, I mean, I've got projects that were eight years before there was a shovel in the ground. So, to, I'm a little skeptical of, I'm a little skeptical of how are we gonna do this without just pointing at a project and saying, you go do whatever you want without having a real community process and things like that. And I'm, and I'm for building, I'm for building affordable housing, yeah. But this is also this, you know, for me, in my district, the way this plays out is I have the Roundhouse Hotel in my district. I have the Comfort Inn, which 10 years ago, we need hotel rooms, we need hotel rooms. You know, in Dorchester, we want to put a hotel here, hotel here, hotel here. Now it's, we don't need those hotels because we went through COVID and we're going we're gonna to turn our hotels into 
I'm not really yeah. sure what we're going to turn them into. So I have some real concerns about when you talk about regulatory, we're going to point on it and, and just send it around third sort of thing is, is what my head's saying to me. So tell me yeah. that that's not going to be the case. And so any regulatory change would absolutely require like, do the regulatory process and community, right. and community feedback oh, session. So I'm, absolutely. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to move on. I'm yeah. going to I'm going to move on. Um, can you talk about so um, two years for Article 80? Any particular? Is that just? Did you did you? Was there a subsection? Was this 25 unit new buildings, 50 unit new buildings, or? Everything that was affordable was at a minimum, uh, like, so what do you quantify that statement for me? So, uh, so I, the analysis that, that we did, which I, I think Devin mentioned as well, um, was on all affordable, uh, on affordable projects that were subject to Article 80. And I, based on some of the things I just heard you say, mm. I actually made a note that um, I think would be helpful for all of us to think about um, project size and, yeah. and and that impact. So I, I I'm glad that. Well, I'm I mean really because it's, there's a there's there's going to be a model. Is it a 25 unit building? Is it a 40 unit building? That's going to be the most efficient or whatever to 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 do. And and if we're going to get behind it with city land and city city oper well city state fed oper dollars, that's where I think we should be looking. How do we how do we permit this size building and now you now we know what we're looking at. Now you point at them in third. Go ahead, go around. You know what I'm saying? There's some surety there in what what the building is, is going to look like. Sorry. Yeah, no, I, I will say from what I've looked at, there there is not a direct correlation between how many units are in a project and how long it takes. Um, certainly larger projects take longer in, in general because there's there's more conversation and questions yeah. to talk about. Um, but I we can get that information back to you, but I can't say specifically that for the ones that take the longest, it's not necessarily because, from my experience, a lot of projects would love to have two years through through Article 80. Right. Honestly, you know, um, I'll turn it over to Council Block. Council Block. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of things for me. Um, one is just to. Uh, underscore um, related to what Joel was talking about and and I think folks know I I used to work at the BHA on some of these like BHA owned um, rehab type projects and it does just strike me that it's it's a little bit crazy when our public housing authority is you know protecting or adding units in the deepest affordability category that everyone wants and then we're putting it through the ringer of our departmental um, processes and I know we used to always go back and forth on are we paying all these fees we used to you know it's just and it's sort of at some point it's like you know to the extent that these processes take longer and cost more money we're just backfilling that with city and then state and federal support for the housing authority so um, it does just feel to me I, I recently became aware that our I hadn't really focused on it before, but I guess, you know, when we do school building projects in the city of Boston, they're sort of exempt from the ordinary zoning um, rules. And uh, it seems to me that, you know, Boston Housing Authority projects, I think we could similarly establish some kind of a norm around, hey, we're doing, we're doing these public buildings. Um, and I mean, I think that's a no brainer with the rehabs where you're literally not changing the shell. But I think even when you are changing the shell, I think at some point prioritization does mean saying let's round third in certain types of cases. And to me, like a BHA project that we're pouring money into is a pretty obvious no brainer on that. So I just want to stress, you know, to me, that's that's certainly an area where it feels like we could expedite a lot. Um, and then just in general, as Jessica knows, I, I, I um, serve, uh, thanks to President Flynn in the council seat on the Neighborhood Housing Trust. Um, and I've only been doing that for a little less than a year and already several times we've had those projects that she mentioned where folks are coming back to us needing more money, more gap filler because of unexpected delays that have stretched out the time. And obviously everyone knows with construction costs going up, there's a particular premium on those these days. Um, but again, it seems to me like I, the idea that we as the city would have processes that would stretch out time and then we would end up using our own resources to fill the gap need that had been created. I mean, it just, 
again, seems like something that we should really try to get away from um, because we all want to have those dollars in the housing trust be going to the maximum number of units and not, you know, not getting increased per unit because of burdens that we're creating. Um, I wondered uh, if you guys could talk a little bit. Um, I, I don't know if you if you have any thoughts on this, but one thing I've struggled with because I've I've been a little jealous of Cambridge and Somerville and their affordable housing overlay, um, and kind of the idea that you would density bonus that you would say, hey, you know, if this is an affordable building, we're going to let people go a little taller, we're going to let people fill a little more of the lot, um, but. Every time my office has tried to figure it out, we find that because because everything is getting zoning relief anyways today, in the sense that everything has to go to ZBA, um, it's hard to figure out where you put that point um, that's like enough to incentivize. And then the other thing is, and this is to Councillor Baker's point, um, for me it's like I want us to figure out how we build affordable housing um, as efficiently as possible, but. I, I don't want us to like delay the construction of market rate housing at the same time that way. I think we have a use problem in general in the city right now where it feels as a counselor like nobody wants to propose housing to me at all. They mostly want to propose lab. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, trying to think about how do we construct a policy here that does incentivize affordable development while also kind of just in general trying to make sure that residential development can go. Anyways, yeah. that's a little bit amusing, but that's kind of that's the, been the puzzle from my mind, and I'm curious what you guys are thinking about it. On that on that second point, and going back to uh, some of Councillor Baker's questions around uh, staff trade offs, I think I want to point to a, a, a success of both this council and, and then and this, the city in the past. We are permitting a lot of affordable housing projects, right? Compared to compared to other cities in, in the region, compared to other uh, peer cities nationally, we we dedicate a lot of our resources to affordable housing creation. We're all here today because we think it's not enough, and we want to do more. And and we, but we, but there were, there was, as Jessica mentioned, over a thousand units of affordable housing permitted last year. And in the past five years, uh, I think it's twenty three percent of the units we permitted were affordable housing. So, um, the way that that has happened in the past is that the same mix of staff are that are doing the. Um, uh, affordable projects are just are mixed in with the folks doing all the other uh, market rate projects that do important job creating economic development projects too um, by uh, creating more job specificity about amongst the existing staff we can provide a little bit more of a streamlined uh, experience for affordable housing developers and because that's already something that we're doing a lot of it doesn't necessarily come at the expense of other projects right because we we we, we need to be doing that work now, as we add as we add significantly more affordable housing, yeah, maybe that might be a trade-off, and there might be some um, uh, prioritization necessary. But I don't I don't think we should um, uh, cast this as uh, if we accelerate affordable housing and and staff it separately, it will come at the expense of other permitting because we we have that it's really just about lining up our existing team a little bit more um, uh, use specific. And uh, on the point about zoning, absolutely hear you because there there are way too many cases going to ZBA, and uh, that under uh, Mayor Wu's leadership and, and Chief Jemison, we do want to have a move to a Boston zoning code that is significantly more predictable and provides more accountability to residents around what's going to get built in their neighborhoods. That's not going to happen overnight, but that is that is a major challenge with um, the concept of as of right uh, affordable housing. What do, what do we mean when we say as of right? What particular uh, uh, elements of the zoning code are the things that are, are holding us back and in some cases we may believe that they're entirely appropriate even for affordable housing like, you know neighborhood context is, is critically important and do you and, say as of right affordable uh, like that that opens us up for abuse yeah that's I mean that, that's a so, that is something you often hear uh, in uh, would, there, are, there, are, there are those who would love the city to move to an as of right affordable housing but that's I think what Cambridge and Somerville. That, that's what exactly yeah. that's what Cambridge and Somerville phrased their policy efforts as, and I think it's important that we, if we are modeling after those efforts, that we understand that what that actually means in a Boston context, and we get into the specifics. Again, it, it, sorry again, but that would be a back to 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 what we were talking about a. a you know that that sort of building size, shape, style. Is it twenty-five units? Is it 
you know, this is what you can do affordable, this is what you can do as of right on this, this, and this, city, city land sort of yep. marrying those two things where, uh, uh, okay, we're gonna move on to, to, to Council, but well, before I do, I want to acknowledge Council Coletta and Council uh, Fernandez Anderson. Um, we're, we're gonna just continue on, oh, I'm sorry, and, and Council Lara is here, is, is here also. We're going to continue with questioning, and when it comes around, you guys will um, opening statement and, and question. Councilor Braden. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Um, I, I I want to pick up I, I know, the, the comment by Councilor Bach that everything is getting zoning relief anyway is a real a huge frustration for us. Uh, I, I don't feel that we are leveraging. Uh, our capacity to encourage developers to build more affordability and and and, and we're f constantly frustrated with the IDP um, unit ratio of 13%. Um, it, it's so it's so yesterday. We we need to. Is, is there any timeline for when? And I know this is a sort of a, it's all part of this big conversation about affordability. Uh, when are we expecting to see the IDP policy changed and? Um, and also the, the um, I think there was some conversation about uh, linkage. Uh, when might we expect that? that? That's something we're actively working on with our colleagues in the uh, mayor's office housing and, the, and the, the mayor's office. So we expect to have announcements on that soon. But I think I hear, absolutely hear your frustration. Um, and I want to um, also point to the fact that through, again, through the work of this council and the citizens of Boston, we now have uh, the right to do inclusionary zoning in Boston. Uh, for the last, past 20 plus years, we've had to, to well, we've, well, we've been a leader and in, in, in actually have it. We were one of the first communities in the country to have an uh, inclusionary development policy. It was all done because of variance and, um, or through variance. Whenever a, a development was seeking a variance, we'd say in, in exchange for that, we expect you to comply with an executive order on affordable housing. We now have the ability to put that into our underlying zoning code uh, to provide much more predictability and assurances that if a project is not seeking a variance, it will still provide the affordable housing our city needs. So that's something you can expect next year that the BPDA to be working on to get into the underlying code. Yeah, and, and you know, the IDP, the, 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 the policy of the developers come in, they, uh, they're building those nine units and they come in yeah. underneath the 10 exactly. and they're, not, they're getting all the variances. They're getting permission to build. They're getting all the all the variances, and we're and the city and the community is not getting anything out of that deal at all. Um, the other question was the, the land audit. Um, I'm just curious. I know we don't have a whole lot of publicly owned land in Austin Brighton to develop, um, but in terms of uh, available land to develop, uh, what what are we looking at? Uh, what was there, were there any findings on that land audit? I the, I will happily share the land audit. Um, uh, with you after the meeting, Councillor, is a pretty comprehensive study. Um, but one of the things we took away from it, there are some uh, large sites that uh, exist in the city where we could add a significant amount of affordable housing and provide that more streamlined approach that Councillor Baker was talking about earlier. Um, places like the um, uh, Austin Street parking lots in, in Charlestown that are directly adjacent to a T stop, the uh, water and sewer parking lots in Lower Roxbury, there, um, uh, the um, uh, Mattapan Public Health Campus. There are places where there are, are significant opportunities to add a, a add housing mix that are on public land and can provide, um, where we can target target spending some of our, our ARPA dollars and create deeply affordable units and, and also you know, community amenities as well. So all of that will be done through a community process and we're uh, launching some of those now. We just had our first meeting uh, three weeks ago on the Austin Street parking lots in Charlestown. Very good, that's all I have for now. Thank Council you. Flynn, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to the <laughs> panelists for being here for the important work that you're doing. Just reading over some of the notes here. Um, when we are building affordable housing and if this plan is implemented, um, we're on the eve of uh, Veterans Day. Are we also making a significant outreach to work with our homeless veterans community? Are they part of this process? And uh, give us a little background on that, that information, please. So, 
So, uh, so specifically, uh, so the the current effort around the executive order is really to look at the at the processes that it takes to get all kinds of affordable housing developed. So, um, so the home the work that we do to to build permanent supportive housing for homeless veterans is certainly sort of in that bucket. We are not given as as Devin mentioned that we are really in the first stages of data analysis here. We have not sort of singled out any specific population type housing in, in the planning work to date, although that, that may be something that comes later in the conversation. Okay. I just want to make sure veterans are part of the discussion and that we are building affordable housing for veterans as well. Mm -hmm. I know we, we have a lot of programs for for many different groups, which I support, but oftentimes I don't see veteran housing included. So that's a concern to me. One other area I wanted to focus on is parking relief for affordable units. I don't think one size fits all. I think there's a critical need for parking in many neighborhoods I can only speak for the area I represent, but many neighborhoods in, in my district really need public parking because they might have, they might need a car, not just to get to work, but also to take their children to various after school programs, whether it's dance recitals or, or athletics or, or tutoring programs. So how would this impact residents that that need a car um, and what what options would there be for those those residents that we're not penalizing them if they if they're also in need of affordable unit that's a great question councillor um one of the so this council and has already passed um the elimination of parking minimums for affordable housing and that doesn't mean that a development can't propose parking based on the population that they're serving or the location of the of the unit they can't exceed the parking maximum but they're not uh, regulatory required to include parking uh, and I think one of the reasons that we wanted to make that change is that that uh, these developments were able to justify through community processes and get CPA variances for less parking, and, and 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 since that was the outcome that was consistently achieved through a community process, we thought that it would streamline the delivery of these units to to take away that requirement, and, and uh, so. It's not, you know, I understand that parking is certainly a, a hot topic in your district and others, and that, and that should be a, a discussion in the specific of a, of a particular project, but we changed the, the minimum standard by which a project will be evaluated. I mean, I, I noticed there that there are, there is support for bicycle parking, which I, which I support, um, but when, when families don't have the ability to use a, an automobile to bring their children to an after-school program, that's a concern that impacts their quality of life. And, and do you know who they, they focus their attention on when that takes place? The mayor and the district city councils. Not necessarily the at-large city councils. They'll, they'll call me up and they'll say, Council Flynn, I'm trying to take my son or my daughter to a dance recital and, and there is no parking because um, this recent project that went up limited parking for, for, um, for residents. So the calls we get are significant and it's a quality of life, in my opinion, for a lot of families that need an automobile to take their children to an after-school program, but also to take to use the car to get to work or to visit their elderly parents somewhere. What do we say to those people, um, and how are we going to help them? 
it, again, Councilor, it's a great point, something we need to work through in a, a project-specific context, and I think there, I mean, uh, to name the obvious issue, something else we needed to work on together is other, other transportation uh, alternatives so that it is equally as convenient to uh, take your family to the after-school program on, on public transportation or whatever other modes of transportation that are available to, uh, to the extent that that's not an option for, uh, uh, for the families you might be talking about. That's a, that is a problem too, right? And we need to, as we're thinking about the future development of Boston, also include that viewpoint. But the viewpoint that you're uh, advancing is absolutely not lost on us and an important part of what, you know, what when Councillor Baker uh, raised earlier, whether uh, any changes to regulation would be done without without feedback. The answer is no, they wouldn't. There, there absolutely needs to be a debate on trade-offs like the ones you're raising. Joel, did you want to say something about uh, something in the, this discussion? Oh, yeah, sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, Count, Council President, uh, just jumping back to your earlier question, I am um, reminded that you had and the council had appropriate had looked at some um, a capacity study for veterans housing in South Boston, and the BHA would be really, it's a little bit ancillary to this discussion, but we're really happy to um, connect with your office to discuss how uh, that effort, which the council provided to some funding for, can um, build on this process that uh, MOH and the BPDA. So at, at your convenience, we're very happy to um, move that project forward. Thank you, Joel, and I want to acknowledge Council of Bach, too, that supported, supported that uh, funding as well, and, and, and Council, Council Baker. So, th so thank you. Um, I, I don't have any further questions. I just wanted to highlight that one size does not fit all. And, and when things aren't working well in, in neighborhoods, the calls go to the mayor and the calls go to the district city council, and we can't duck those calls. And we have to respond, and we have to let residents know why there is no parking in their neighborhood to take their children to a particular location. So difficult conversations, but I guess my final point is district city councilors should be involved in decision-making um, as, as it relates to this proposal. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Council Cletta, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair Baker. I'm actually surprised. I thought I was going to go after uh, Councilor Lara, but I, oh, I am. I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready. I just want to make sure we got it right. Okay. Thank you, Councilor Lara. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning. I'm so sorry that I'm late. Um, thank you to the sponsor of uh, of this order, and thank you to Mayor Wu for her um, uh, executive order as well. And thank you all to your um, to all of you just for your work. I have a deep respect for everybody on this uh, panel, so thank you so much. Um, there's there's a lot there's a lot that I uh, would love to ask. I'm wondering how many questions I'm, I'm going to get for this round, <laughs> just so I can prioritize. You good? You good time? Okay, great. Um, everybody knows in my district where um, we're building and growing exponentially, and it is deeply impacting um, our most vulnerable. Everybody's getting uh, um, very antsy to figure out, you know, when some of this is going to be implemented, just because displacement rates are so high. I know everybody knows this, and um, I, I am deeply um, pleased to hear about the, the five steps that you all listed. So even though I was late, I was trying to listen in, and, but apologies if my questioning is, is redundant. Um, I am happy to hear about the reform of IDP. We desperately need it ahead of Plan East Boston, which Devin, I know you all are working on. Uh, this is the effort to rezone for everybody. This is the effort to rezone East Boston because our zoning is archaic. And right now we are trying to figure out how to incentivize developers to build uh, smaller but having more affordability. And so having this IDP threshold lowered is going to be really, really important, especially if we're making projects that are as of right. Um, I'm thinking of the six pack that was proposed. If these projects are as of right, we need to extract as much affordability as possible. And so I'm wondering if you all are considering that and, and any conversations that have been had um, just for the record here today. Yeah, absolutely, Councillor. And that's critically important to any, any zoning changes we, we make. We want to make sure that we're um, 
uh, leveraging as much affordability as possible. It's important to then, that when it, from the private market, balance that with feasibility, right? Make sure that the projects are still uh, possible to, to happen. Um, but in, uh, in East Boston in particular, I think it is, it's just, but it's, it's such a um, visible case of um, the zoning code not meaning enough. And because mm -hmm. every project is a negotiation and pretty much, it, you know, it, most, our, our team has great stats on this. I don't have it off the top of my head, but um, the, the, the majority of existing buildings in East Boston, if, the, if that building burned down, it couldn't be built again exactly the way it looks without a zoning variance. And that's a problem, right? That, mm -hmm. that the, that the um, majority of the community is, is non-conforming and it makes it very difficult to predict what will happen. And then that, that leads to you know, hundreds of negotiations a year and it's exhausting for community members and it's uh, taxing on staff and it's not, the, mm -hmm. it's not really where we want to uh, be spending our resources. We want to be able to set a zoning code that means something, have people have a, a, a anticipation of what that um, means for the future of their community and be able to predict exactly what benefits will come from new development, particularly in the form of, of affordable housing. And um, because the, 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 you know, the, across a lot of Boston, the, the uh, three-decker, uh, and then and this, uh, the six pack typology is something that you see a lot of. It's important that our affordable housing policies, as we rethink them, touch that um, the smaller units in, a, in, a, in an appropriate and feasible way. Uh, mm -hmm. So that, uh, and that gets to Councillor Breeden's point earlier about, you know, there's just, there's a, the, the, because of the current policy, there's an incentive to build right under the threshold, mm -hmm. and maybe we need to address that. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm happy to know that you all are looking at that. And I think you were talking about. Uh, the negotiations that happen, and in, in my conversations with individual builders, they say, as they should, because this is their this is their work. They say that affordability is expensive, and a lot of what is being proposed is happening at the waterfront, or it's happening within the flood zone. And so what they tell me is that, well, I'm sorry, you're getting a lot of affordability, or if I were to do affordability, it's at the expense of making it more resilient, right? And so I'm worried in this process that we're going to be fast tracking affordable housing, but it's not meeting our standards when it comes to resiliency or promoting our, um, our, our goals when it comes to, to a green new city or, or, or um, uh, a just transition. So I'm wondering if those are also being considered in ensuring that we're looking at both at the same time. So I can speak from the perspective of the Mayor's Office of Housing and particularly um, one of the things that we're looking at in this order is, is our design review process, which at the Mayor's Office of Housing, we tie really closely to our funding process, right? Because we, we are, we're lending to these projects, and so we're important stakeholders in the process. And we're really trying to prioritize a sustainability and resiliency, and also uh, we've done this on the zero carbon side for new production and, and are in conversations with colleagues at BPDA and at the Department of Environment on the resiliency side about really trying to um, track the real benchmarks of how much cost does that really add? Because a lot of the, th the measures that we take either for energy efficiency or resiliency are, th they, they sound really fancy, right? But some of them are actually quite simple or things that you're doing, you would need to do anyways, you just do it a slightly, you know, you do it a different way. Mm -hmm. So we're really trying to prioritize that and also just want to um, put in another sort of sideline issue, which is uh, because we have done so, we've been so active in our ac acquisition opportunity program in East Boston, I'm really excited about some conversations that we can have about how we're deploying ARPA dollars towards efficiency and resiliency measures and how we can particularly look at, at some of the work we've done in East Boston and bolstering some of that. So uh, so it, it is is a very active part of our conversation and, and a real priority for all of us. Thank you. Um, going to affordability, we all hear it from our communities, affordable isn't actually affordable to uh, the community. Um, and so I think one thing that has been incredibly successful has been the City of Boston voucher program through BHA. And so one thing that, that I was thinking about and, and wondering if you could speak to is um, incentivizing developers, because again, in my individual conversations, I'm asking folks, have you talked to BHA? Uh, because it's guaranteed money for them and it's a way to grow that program. So I'm wondering if that's also being considered and will be included in this program as well. Yeah, so we are definitely considering how to match vouchers to existing units to 
both you know increase the level of affordability and increase more affordable units. So as, as we do looking at IDP and linkage and other studies, I think that's definitely on the table and because we know there's a huge need for the deeply affordable units. You good? Yep, thank you. Council Lowry, you have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and thank you uh, to all the members of the administration for being here today and to Councillor Bach for um, continuing to move this work forward. Um, with Mayor Wu's executive order last month to speed up the process of approving affordable housing in the city, I think that we still need to delve deeper when it comes to exploring all of the opportunities that we have for zoning relief for affordable housing in the city of Boston. I, um, a few weeks ago, I filed a hearing order to explore um, special protection zones, um, particularly around um, transit-oriented transit special protection zones. One, to prevent displacement, but I think that there's an opportunity here when we talk about affordable housing relief. How are we incentivizing affordable housing in transit corridors? Um, one, so that would be my question. What are we doing right now? Because if, if we are going to look into a zoning amendment that creates these special protection zones and transit corridors, what can be included in it? Are there things that you're considering already in terms of protecting um, neighbors who live in transit corridors against displacement, but also incentivizing affordable housing on those corridors? And secondly, if we're looking, if you're reviewing and looking at the zoning code specifically, one of the things that I would like to focus on that I've continued to have um, internal conversations and hope to move forward on the council is this idea of creating zoning overlays that don't just incentivize affordable housing, but incentivize affordable housing in climate resilient locations. Um, so if you could talk a little bit more about those two issues. Yeah. Councilor, I mean, that's very exciting, excited to um, work with you to uh, uh, go delve deeper into the special protection zones concept, but everything you just said is 100% in alignment with the way that the administration is thinking about uh, um, the future of Boston zoning code. I mean, it is uh, critically important that we, uh, and this gets to some of the questions that Councilor Flint was asking around parking earlier, it's critically important that we um, as we're looking at uh, increasing density, it's done in appropriate locations next to transit in ways that um, not only protect uh, existing communities from displacement pressures, but, all, but actually provide opportunities for um, a, a greater and deeper level of uh, affordable housing creation that, you know, housing units that exist off the, the private market and they are therefore inherently um, uh, immune to um, market-driven displacement measures. At the same time, it's incredibly important as we uh, think about the future of our city that we're, that climate change and climate resilience is integrated into everything we do, and that needs to be a core part of um, everything that BPDA does. So um, the mayor's charged us with uh, revamping the and reimagining the planning development agency in a way that puts affordability, equity, and resilience at the center of everything we do, and that, I think, is the, the heart of your comment there. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And so for the city's land audit, there were, let me see if I um, find this correctly so that I don't give you the wrong numbers, 9.5 million square feet of parcels that are vacant and underutilized in the city. Have you created an overlay of the location of those par parcels in terms of um, climate resiliency? There is a coastal flood resilience overlay in, a, in the existing zoning code, so it's quite mm -hmm. easy. You know, we can, we're happy to produce this map for you if it would be helpful yes. uh, to, um, to, to, to give you the map of the largest uh, vacant uh, um, uh, public owned sites with the coastal flood resilience overlay, and you can, you, can, you can see it. And some of them, we were just talking about the Boston Water and Sewer parking lots with the staff group yesterday. Half of those, half of that site is within the coastal flood resilience overlay, so that absolutely will need to be part of um, the, 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 any future development at that location if, we're, if we were to explore it. So I think um, it's a short answer, yes. A longer answer, it, it's all about the, the specific parcels. Is the coastal flooding overlay the only kind of in, like environmental justice or climate resilience kind of overlay that the zoning code currently no, has? No, Article 37 in the zoning code is all about green building standards and, mm -hmm. and helping um, advance a build, building typologies that are uh, 
more efficient and more uh, greener. And, and we're actively working on improving that. We're uh, exploring uh, net zero carbon zoning in our zoning codes. So there's, there's a lot more that can be done in that space. And again, I'm excited to work with you on it. Thank you. I'm mostly asking for the record because we want to make sure that people listening in can, can hear about this. Um, so again, in the terms of zoning, I actually want to go back to something that President Flynn said about the um, veterans housing specifically, more so be, because to tie it into the inclusionary development policy. So right now in the lottery applications, we do ask people whether or not they are veterans. And we ask people also if they are city of Boston residents, do we prioritize veterans in the IDP when they're applying for the IDP units? We prioritize city of Boston residents, and so we, do we prioritize veterans in the same way? It depends on the, um, on the specific marketing plan and population of, of, that, of, of the project that, um, that, that the lottery is for. So we do prioritize all Boston residents for the units, but we don't prioritize any other it, it depends on the project. It depends on the project. So for some project, like let's say the, you know, the, the pride, there is prioritization or some kind of LGBTQ friendly, but we don't have, we don't do that currently in our. So, so, and, and I, I want to check for you to make sure okay. that, but, um, mm -hmm. but I'm pretty confident in saying that for like the pride as an example would have a Boston residency preference and, um, it's an age restricted property, so yep. there's a preference if you're <laughs> if you're in the right age group. Um, but I I do not believe in that building. There are other special population preferences. I'm looking at Dan. No, I know that you can't have any. I know that they don't have any special population preferences. That it's more like an LGBTQ friendly building. So I understand that there is not any. I'm more so asking, with the inclusionary development units, is there preference that goes across all projects? like the Boston resident preference that, that exists. So, yeah, go yeah, on. Yeah, I, I, no, I think it's project specific. So there's a, a number of different preferences that sometimes come to play, mm -hmm. but there, it's project specific. So across all IDP units, there isn't um, any preferences. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that is incredibly helpful. So with all of the parcels that we're looking at and the projects that, that we have, are we, how are we collaborating with land trusts, CDCs, and nonprofit developers to develop? You know, I'm, again, I'm going back to the I'm going back to the land audit. <laughs> so, um, tell me a little more what your thinking is there. Yeah. So, um, sorry, you said land trusts. Where were your other CDCs, <laughs> nonprofit developers? Okay. We're, we're, I'm, this is I'm having a specific issue in my district where um, we ha we have a, a developer who's a bad actor just had a, a landmarked, a uh, very, very close to being landmarked home that was tore, that was, that was torn down. And our hope is that we can get a, C, a local CDC to purchase mm -hmm. it and go through a proper community process about what should go there. And so I'm wondering how we are collaborating with land trusts and local CDCs to provide zoning relief in a way that can incentivize them to build affordable housing in some of these um, empty parcels. So similarly to, um to one of the previous, oh, to I think the question about veterans, right? We're not, in, in terms of the work of the executive order around permitting, um, we're not talking about different potential developers in, in a different way, right? Because it's mostly about city regulatory processes. Mm -hmm. But in terms of programs and specifically, you know, some of the things we're trying to build or acquire, um, we, in the Mayor's Office of Housing work really closely with, with those types of um, developers and, and players. Um, we've been particularly excited about some of the work that we've done with land trusts on the Acquisition Opportunity Program and their ability to build out land trusts through acquisitions. Um, we, we do a lot of work with community development corporations and, um, and frequently we'll be in conversations with them about special events that have happened in their service area or, um, or special opportunities. So uh, we, and, and you know, we, we work with people that, that bring strong projects to us. So, um, so in a lot of conversations and 
And I'll say on the land audit side, there's, there's sort of two conversations that are coming out of the ARPA funding stream, and one is about the, the large parcels that, that Devin's been talking about, and then the Mayor's Office of Housing is also very focused on the small parcels, both in our inventory and, um, and in the inventory of BPDA and other partner agencies that are good for um, smaller home ownership development, and I think that's, I know that's also an opportunity that particularly land trusts are thinking about. I have one last question because I know that I'm coming up on my time. Um, thank you, Chair, for being so gracious with me. Uh, and this is going to be specific to, to my district. One of the things in District 6, specifically in West Roxbury, is that we have less than 1% of all the affordable housing in the city. So one of the issues, the, the reason why that is an issue for me in particular, is that West Roxbury also has the highest concentration of seniors in the entire city. And what we found is that in a very residential neighborhood where people have been living for many generations, sometimes people's grandparents, people's parents want to downsize. They want to pass on the house to their children, and they want to be able to find affordable housing in their neighborhood so they can stay nearby. Now, if you have less than 1% of all of the affordable housing in the city in your neighborhood, then we're rubbing up against the people who live in that neighborhood, who are, grew up in that neighborhood, seniors and retirees who might be living on Social Security, not being able to find smaller homes so that they can stay close to their children, close to their grandchildren. And so can you talk to me a little bit about what are some of the zoning challenges uh, in West Roxbury <laughs> specifically to build higher density and more affordable housing, yeah, and no, what can we do about it? That's an, an excellent question, and I think um, something that we would love to work with, the, with you in the West Roxbury community on addressing. I, I think we want to make sure that there are affordable housing opportunities spread across all of Boston's neighborhoods. That's I think, critically important to the administration. We find every opportunity to uh, increase um, the proportion and, and the number of units available. Um, I think this goes back to your question about that, I guess, the special protection zone transit-oriented mm -hmm. development question. That, and that, you know, there is West Roxbury compared to some other neighbors in the city a little less transit accessible, but there are, there, there, you know, there is, there is the commuter rail there, there so there, it does qualify as a, as a transit-oriented neighborhood. So we'd love to um, uh, work with the community on creating incentives for affordable housing creation. Um, one of the things that I think that is um, limiting is that there are less public land opportunities in, in West Roxbury. So yeah. some of the some of the tools that we've deployed in, in other neighborhoods are not as available. So we need to think about other tools. The ones in the land audit are all by the quarry and nobody wants to live yeah, exactly. or do anything yeah. next to the yeah, blast. And, and totally <laughs> financially feasible. It would be wonderful if, they, if we could do something quickly there, but it's, it's all alleged and all very okay. hard to, to build upon. Thank you, upon, I appreciate that. I do just, sure. and I just want to add, um, I, love to be a part of that conversation about zoning tools. On the funding side, um, in so we are, MOH is currently in the process of reviewing proposals for our annual um, request for proposals for affordable, new, and new affordable housing and preservation affordable housing projects. And we do give a priority to projects that are in neighborhoods that are below the citywide average for income mm -hmm. restricted housing. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, the Neighborhood Housing Trust, which um, Councilor Bach represents the council on, and um, the Community Preservation Committee are really, really um, conscious in the, their own decision making about trying to spread resources into neighborhoods in the city that are not typically bringing projects forward um, or are below that citywide average. So um, that doesn't solve the problem of us needing a project, but, I, but we are trying to incentivize um, projects to come forward in, in places that are underserved, like, like West Roxbury. So um, so we, we try to do a little bit uh, where we can. I will pass that information on to the CDC <laughs> that we're working with. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And, Councilor, just to add on to your earlier question about tran displacement of transit corridors, um, thanks to the Council, um, we do have $20 million of ARPA funds in our Acquisition Opportunity Program mm -hmm. that's specifically focused on um, acquisitions along um, transit corridors and where new infrastructure is happening where there might be added displacement pressures. And so we're just getting that rolling, but we're kind of actively trying to think around the whole half corridor and other corridors where we can make acquisitions. I will circle back to AOP questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Fernandez Anderson. Uh, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. I, um, <clears throat> so my question is obviously I, I want to focus and I just want to bring it uh, very low to the ground so that we can um, break this down. I want to understand um, what you think, obviously, of Roxbury's situation, um, past and present, in terms of um, how you acquired all of this land, 
and where we are today um, in terms of the 54% uh, percent of affordable rentals already existing in Roxbury um, as part of the inventory of the 80% of all rentals in Roxbury. Um, I think it's about 80 to 85 percent. I don't have the exact number on me. Um, and then I want to compare that to the average of um, income, which I think is about 35,000 a year for people in Roxbury. Now this happened in Beacon Hill. Remember Beacon Hill um, in the 1800s when uh, black people lived there and they were I mean, it was, it, was, it was filthy. People didn't even have places to sleep. They weren't on the streets. And then eventually uh, they land banked, right? And then they drove them out. They pushed them into South End. Um, and when they were pushed into South End, then the land started getting repaired and rich whites would come in and start building up and it became more prominent and affluent. And then when they went into South End, they did the same thing. They filled it up with crime because that's how our criminal justice system has to happen. We have to have crime. We have to have no jobs and no uh, workforce. We can't have proper affordable housing or uh, home ownership to build that, to build uh, to build wealth. So they then pushed them out again into Lower Roxbury, and eventually they pushed them out to Roxbury. And now in Roxbury, they're pushing us out again. And so with all the affordable rental, my question to you is in consideration to the 80% affordable rental in one neighborhood, 54% of that is actually affordable. 80% rental, 54% affordable. Then you have us sharing more than half of all low threshold housing, more than half of recidivism or returning citizen or halfway homes. We have more services, more nonprofits, more lower income of anything in Boston. But we also have land, land that was acquired, and you'll give me clarification mm -hmm. as to how. Um, and so the economy, right, in Roxbury, does not thrive. We can't flip the black dollar or any dollar. Our Rock, Roxbury master plan um, then said, we'll build out, we'll create business districts that will allow some economic mobility, uh, increase traffic in these business corridors, and we'll build affordable housing. And everyone is like, we need that. We need that, we want that. We want affordable housing, but what the community is asking for, specifically people in Roxbury, and I grew up in Roxbury, so I know this. I grew up with the shootings and the violence and the drugs. And so we say we want affordable home ownership. Give us a chance to own a home so we can actually invest in our community, so we can rid of the crime, because we know that when there's no poverty, there's no crime. And so I filed a moratorium, and I guess what I want to understand is how is speeding up this process, considering you have a lot of land in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. What is your plan to increase affordable home ownership? And then please tell me what is affordable uh, considering $35,000 a year average. Um, and then in comparison to the other neighborhoods, how are we being fair or racially equitable when we bypass, say, and I'm, and I'm for it, I want more affordable rentals, I want lots of it, I want us to build big sky rises. In fact, I think a low threshold housing like that sky rise in, uh, that we're building here in downtown, I think we could do that here in downtown. I think we should go up. Um, but tell me, what is the plan? How is this going to impact Roxbury? And how are we going to make it affordable? And how did you get the land? And how are you going to build a uh, quality of life? And how is BPDA going to do all of that while streamlining the community process to do a better job with the people that already have been disenfranchised and hurt? So, thank you, Councillor. That's a, 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 well, first, I just want to say thank you for 
centering the conversation on systemic racism and, and historic inequalities, because I think that's important that we start the conversation there, and particularly in Roxbury, where there is so much public land. So, so thank you for that. It's a very, there's, so that, that was a very big question. So there's, I think we start with parts of it and we can jump into to You're others. a great note taker. But, I think uh, you do fantastic with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying my best here. Um, I think um, maybe one of the most important things to say is that it's really, that community process is incredibly important in listening to community and community priorities and incorporating them into our um, uh, regulatory decisions and use of public resources is what, what what we need to be doing, what we need to be doing more of. I think um, in some cases we've done a good job of that in recent history in, in Roxbury. We've had the Roxbury Strategic Master Plan Oversight Committee is a community made up of, um, uh, of uh, representatives from your district that guide all public land development. And we did, um, starting in 2017, um, now we're we in our fifth year of community process on establishing a common framework for community-led development community-led decision making on public land development and there there are, there are uh, trade-offs there and one thing we've heard very clearly from community members when it comes to uh, developing public lands that they want job creating economic development uh, to create economic mobility for uh, Roxbury residents so that absolutely needs to be part of our um, uh, uh, both public land development and private land development strategies which are workforce training programs and helping people participate in the growth of Boston's economy. At, at the same time, um, public land resources are finite, and one of the um, things we heard also through the, the recent uh, processes, particularly in Nubian Square, is that, we wanna, that there was a strong community sentiment to prioritize um, where, when that land is used for housing is instead of uh, economic development, that there be a very substantial portion of uh, affordable housing on the um, on that land, and that uh, affordable that, home ownership. Yeah, well, exactly. That's what, and and that with a significant preference for home ownership. And so, in some cases, so one thing we've done is when we're developing uh, redeveloping public land, uh, and I didn't answer your question about how we came to own it. Right, we can come back to that. But when we were redeveloping public land, um, working with the community so that community members get to actually write the requirements, right, and work work with us. So one thing we wrote into um, uh, recent dispositions of public land were, uh, in some cases, requirements for uh, affordable home ownership units, at, or at least strong preferences. Um, and you, um, we recently. Um, are, we're moving toward wrapping up the um, disposition process and moving toward development of P3, which is the largest public land um, a vacant site in, in Boston. And that, uh, that both proposals there include substantial uh, commitments to affordable home ownership and new construction of, of home ownership units with, I think, some creative strategies for wealth creation over time, which is something we've also heard is really important for Roxbury residents. Um, I, on the, uh, moratorium topic. I, I think one thing that the, both mayor, the mayor, and Chief Jemison have said to us is it's it's really important that we move forward and we and that we use the resources we have to help the people who are in need now as quickly as possible. And that's one of the reasons why we're here at this council hearing this morning to talk about how we can move things quickly into to, into construction to deliver real value for Bostonians or or, uh, or Roxbury residents in your district. So I don't. Uh, I don't think we support the moratorium on public land development idea on that principle, but to the, to the extent that um, there's feedback on how we might be more responsive to community needs with, on, in repositioning vacant underused utilized property, we are 100% eager to do that because at the end of the day, this the public land is belongs to the, the people of the district and that it was in some cases taken from uh, the people of the district through urban renewal in the 60s and 70s, and there's that in and of itself um, is a is a as a terrible social justice legacy, and I think it makes it imperative that uh, we take a restorative lens to how that land is used, and but but then do that quickly and and deploy something that is a benefit to um, uh, Roxbury residents. You said all the right things. I just I would like for you to define it. 
I, I think that when you say things like, we, we should repair the harm, when you say things like, yes, affordable homeownership, or at least a strong priority on that, a preference, then I want to know exactly what is the percentage of that. Then I want to know what is affordable. I want to understand if you are going to speed something up, then how will you make it better? If the community is already saying that you're not listening, it's already, like, for example, the city will give out money for, to do affordable projects, and the CDCs, specifically Madison Park and a couple of others, will come in and will build a concrete block, just a box, no amenities. And we went into ZBA just last week, a couple weeks ago, and they specifically said, we said, where are black children supposed to go outside to play? Where's the green space? And they said, they can play on the sidewalk. This is a board member. And so when you have that level of interaction, where no one is listening because the city knows better and the powers that be, they know better what black people need than black, when, than black people themselves know what they need, right, for themselves. And so they continue to perpetuate these levels of blanket policies that does not actually resolve specific situations or issues as to how it impacts black people in Roxbury or black and brown people in Roxbury or poor white people in Roxbury. So I really want us to just say AMI doesn't work, whatever AMI the calculation we're using, and I understand that's on a federal level, and I want to talk about how we're working on that, but $35%, $30,000 average income means that no matter how deeply affordable you call it, it's not reaching the people in Roxbury. So when you build, people outside of Roxbury are going to come and rent in Roxbury, displacing, further displacing people in Roxbury. Mm -hmm. We lost one third black people last year, and we continue to lose it. We continue to drive people out, but then we say beautiful words about equity and affordable, and it's not affordable. It doesn't resolve the issues in Roxbury. You have land in Roxbury, mostly acquired by, with harm, taken by people. Now people are saying that belongs to us. Fix it, include us, and, and build that quality of life. Allow us workforce or careers or ways of closing the wealth gap. What you're proposing or what you've been doing so far, and I know not you specifically, Devin, but what has been happening so far is not addressing the issue. It's the opposite of what you're doing in West Roxbury or other, other affluent areas. I want, I want affordable housing in Fenway. I want it in Beacon Hill. I want it in downtown, right? I want a lot of it. Let's build a thousand. Let's build all of it. But not, but Roxbury deserves just, you know, green spaces. We want to breathe air. We die 30 years sooner than Back Bay. So how are we working on that? Yeah. I, don't want, I don't want to talk about the beautiful words. I want to understand exactly what is the percentage, how are we making it affordable, what is that number? And are we looking at projects that maybe we can use those IDP funds to bring home ownership into Roxbury? Are we looking yeah. at ideas like that? Yeah, um, great point. I think it sounds like you want a very data-driven uh, answer, which I'm happy to provide, and we can provide more uh, backup. But I think it is imperative that we are pr producing affordable housing in all neighborhoods in Boston. It's important that Roxbury residents help, help us advocate for affordable housing creation in West Roxbury or Charlestown or whom, where, in other places where it, it is needed. And, and, I, and I, I think on behalf of the DPDA, totally understand and want to convey the fairness message of what you're, um, uh, what, and equity message of what you're conveying. In terms of actual, what does affordability mean? Well, there, there is a like, precise de definition of that driven by AMIs, which I, I think you know and happy to um, produce that for the record after the meeting. I think one thing that maybe we could work together on that might be helpful is um, separating out uh, neighborhood like high level AMI definitions, like the, the average income in Roxbury, and then the, the average income of Roxbury, Roxbury residents that are most at risk for displacement pressures. Because if you live in a BHA unit or if you live in a 
affordable housing unit, and Rock Roxbury does have a, dis a disproportionate share, as you're pointing out, of a affordable housing. Um, that, though, by definition, the people living in those units have lower incomes. The, it, the most at-risk resident in, in Roxbury is the resident that lives in a market rate unit and is a um, susceptible to their landlord raising the rent uh, substantially next year. And, and that resident, what, whether they have higher income or lower income than the, the resident in the affordable housing unit, is the resident that I think we, as a city, need to be most focused on trying to provide opportunities for, uh, whether that's to stay in their housing unit or, in, or to move somewhere that is uh, protected from, the, from the, market pressure. Sorry, uh, Mr. Chair, just sorry, last question. But does that mean that you can prioritize Roxbury residents for Roxbury projects? I, we would love to. There's, um, I think right. you may know this as well, uh, there are uh, fair housing rules that are right. about preventing uh, concentrations of poverty and segregation that make it difficult for us to implement something that I think we all see as a displacement prevention measure, but um, federal policy makes that very difficult. So to sum up, there's a lot of land in Roxbury taken from people, displaced people, you will continue to build in Roxbury. They will not all be affordable home ownership, probably minimum. And you'll continue to do it, and you cannot prioritize people from Roxbury. I, I think there are tools that we can, well, for starters, that I, I think it's important that we use public land for open space, community gardens, and, and non-housing uses, too. Please. Uh, and that is a priority in, in Roxbury as in, the, in other places. But we need, a, we need affordable housing in our city, we need market rate housing in our city, and we need uh, subsidy tools that help people in, in Boston purchase their first home. And I know the team from MLH can talk a little bit about that. So I, I want, I'm thinking that one thing that would be helpful to continue this conversation would be for us to, um, to put together our pipeline of affordable home ownership projects, um, many of which are on some of the, the parcels that, that are publicly owned land that are that are in our pipeline under What's the AMI for those affordable home ownership? So the majority of those AMIs are, um, and, and I want to get you the exact numbers, but the majority of those home ownership units are set for um, buyers either at 100% of area median income or 80% of area median income. I know I that, couldn't afford it. So I... <laughs> I'm a city councilor and I can't afford it. I live in Roxbury. I can't afford that. What do you think a person in McDonald's knows would afford? I can't afford it. I hear you, and and I and I want to get it's those not exact affordable. numbers. And I think it's not affordable. The, but mm -hmm. that's not that's one tool in the toolbox. Right. And I hear you. We can we can work mm -hmm. together to find ways to bring down um, the AMI levels for uh, home ownership units that are Please. being produced. But that but and that's 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 a tool. But also we. The, uh, through the Boston Home Center, the mayor's office of housing also offers down payment assistance programs and other ways for um, people. That doesn't high. qualify people, though. That that just helps with deposits. That doesn't actually make you your AMI go up. This doesn't qualify you would, through the banks, does it? Uh, those are for people who are already. It, it will it, help you be able to purchase the home. You still wouldn't bring down qualify. Like payment. if your if your AMI is still lower than that. It does, you'll still have a problem, even if you are sub, some, some, somehow, I, I understand what you're saying, some, somehow subsidizing or whatever, like it, it yeah, still price. puts you in a precarious situation to buy a home. That, that is not for Roxbury. So, uh, and, and I think this, I mean, I, I think this is a conversation that we, that we really need to have. I, I will say that the, I just, I do want to be clear that the, the AMI levels, it doesn't mean you can afford it, but it's, a, it's an upper ceiling, right? You yeah. don't have to be 100, at 100% at of AMI exactly to, to buy it. You have to be at 100% or below. To I'm be giving you a comparison, a right? Mm -hmm. If I'm just be, right below 80, then what about everybody else? I'm showing you that the majority of people can't do it. Right. I'm showing you that that's not for Roxbury. I'm telling you that that's not for Roxbury. I know that this is a conversation. I'm, I'm being very raw with you so you can really feel it and understand that this is a conversation. This is real. You're dis it's displacing people, and your policies and your blanket policies does not work. And it's, it's hurting people, 
And this is why we have continuous poverty and issues in black communities. This is why we continue to have gun violence. This is why people come in here and cry over their friends getting killed. It's a serious problem. Your housing policies are blanket policies. It does not work for poor people in Roxbury. You have a lot of land there, and you're saying you're gonna to continue to build it. I would like to talk right. about how you can do it better. And we would absolutely, that was, if you took the words right out of my mouth, we would absolutely love to do that with you. And okay. we're open to every single idea. Don't I think tell the them only idea off. that we're not open to is do nothing. Okay. Right? We, we, that's why we're here today. We have a team of leaders across the government, to include our city council leaders, that want us to do something, I think the only thing we're in opposition to is do nothing. We need to do, we need to do Oh no, I don't want to do nothing. I don't want to do nothing. I want, I don't want to do nothing. Mr. Chair, thank you so much. I don't yeah. want to do nothing. <clears throat> I want to be very clear. I want a lot of affordable housing everywhere because I know that the two sides can be conflated. I'm talking about building quality sort of stress de decompressors in Roxbury. I'm talking about those urban farmings and jazz clubs and different arts and culture spaces. I'm not talking about doing nothing. Let's, I wanna be very clear. And I think we're on the same page and I think you guys want to do the right thing. I'm saying that it's very difficult mm -hmm. and we have to really force the city to spend more money to invest in ways that we actually address the most vulnerable people. And at, at, in present time, what you're offering does not address the issues of Roxbury. Councilor, I'd like to move. I'd like to move on. Please. I will come back I if really you want. I really appreciate so, you. Um, so, I'm going to give everyone two minutes if if they want, and it will be a two minutes that I'm going to time. So, um, the first question was, how did you get the land? You said urban renewal. That's kind of a blanket statement. We talking '95? Is that where most of when the when I-95 was in the discussion? Is that when the urban renewal happened and most of the land was? Whatever happened with it? Um, quick and you answer. don't have to go deep yeah, into it. Very quick answer is actually no, because there are multiple urban renewal plans in Roxbury. Okay. The Federal Highway Program was one, but they're at you know, Campus High, Kitchard Square. They all had different objectives, and okay. they all happened at different times. Okay. Just wanted to just wanted to um, just wanted to tighten that up there. And and so my opinion here is, I think if we want to act quickly, we could follow the NHI model, which would be back to the buildings, whether they're at 25, 40, or 50, let's identify 10 parcels of land and, 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 and design what we want built there, and then go to a developer and say, build this, it's gonna cost 30 million bucks, we'll give you 10, 15 towards it, you, you would have to front the rest of it. That's how I think we could get it going quickly. I mean, because anything that that's, we start talking about today is, two to three years away. So the, NHA, the NHI model was, was a good model. I think we should put it on steroids again. Um, and that was, okay, so Kenzie, you have two minutes. Can I take slightly Can you what? Two, can I go slightly longer than that? Just because- Yeah, we'll, see, like we'll see what your content is. <laughs> 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 All right, two things. One is just quickly to say, because I think, you know, uh, to Councillor Anderson's point, the, you know, AMI today, 100% is for a two-family household at 112,000, at 80%, it's at 89,000. Um, I think that, you know, the reality, as we all know, is that if we push too much low below that from a home ownership perspective, we can't get folks to lend to our borrowers. And I think that raises the point of why, and I know Councillor Lara shares my enthusiasm for co-ops. I think that when we talk about home ownership, and trying to get people an equity stake. The reality is there is that band where folks folks want to be building equity, but they make too little to get a home ownership loan, even if we substantially try to push those limits down, um, but at the same time want to be building that equity and not just stuck in rentals. So I just want to stress for that like middle space, I think we really do need to be, and as is something Jessica and I have talked a lot about, we have to keep supporting cooperative models. Um, the quick run of things I wanted to say, and ISD is in your group, right? They aren't yeah, here today, absolutely. but they're in the group, okay. Um, just some things that I've heard colleagues say today that just I hope that you guys are gonna be looking into. One thing related to Councillor Baker's point about this 2540 unit type thing, I mean, it would be great to think about is there a way that we can have kind of almost like a plan book? And I know that you have that um, in some ways for um, the green building, um, mm -hmm. Jessica, but to the point about like, that balance between community review. Like, I would love if we, if we somehow figured out how to say, hey, in a bunch of these zones, we're gonna let people who build affordable projects 
go above the FAR and height, but they're going to be building from this kind of approved set where we've looked at them, they're attractive, like they fit the fabric, you know, just, I'm just thinking through, is there a way that you could, we could have something like that? And that's probably a longer process, but just flagging that I think plan books and kind of things that people can wrap their arms around and then like, uh, you can use it like a cookie cutter in a good way, um, I think is really valuable. Um, would love to see us shift more projects um, that are affordable kind of from large project review to small project review um, within the Article 80 um, system, um, in addition to other ways that we could just expedite. I do think, as I said before, that the BHA should be totally out of that, frankly. I think when we're doing, I think we should be acting as a public developer on housing, and when we do that on our public land, we should be being aggressive about um, about kind of recognizing that the public review is built into the fact that the public agency is deciding to meet a critical need. Um, would love to see us figure out how we identify areas around the city where we have a lot of that, you know, existing buildings are non-conforming. And is there a way to say, basically to make non-conforming conform and just say, like, if you build something that's, if you're a triple-decker neighborhood and you want to build a triple-decker, like, we're going to make that work for you, right? And I just, Great. I want to flag, you know, that's a big thing. I think that ADUs, when we talk about, like, this, that affordable with a small A, how do people keep that next generation? You know, roll, I know we've had our pilots and stuff, but rolling out um, accessory dwelling units more broadly across the city would be great. Um, you know, I actually would love to see, maybe, and, and this might be a part of um, thinking about how you do an affordable housing overlay in a city like Boston, where our zoning code is so weird, like thinking about an, an AFFH inflected one, like could we actually pick places where, to Councilor Fernandez Anderson's point, we have, and, and to Councilor Lara's point with West Roxbury, pick places where we know we have less than the city average of affordable housing and say, in these zones, so it's not one size fits all, but like in these zones, we're actually like having, reaching more affordable, affordable housing is a goal of the cities. It's a goal in line with our affirmatively furthering fair housing obligations. And so therefore we have kind of this zoning relief targeted there in those places. I think that could be really neat. I happen to think that you could actually do that today um, with muscular use of the AFFH zoning provisions that we put in already. So like, I don't know if you need a further thing, but it might be clearer for everyone if you if we put some geographic things out there. But you got double I, time. I am very grateful, Mr. Chair, and I'll just say, yeah, as somebody who represents a lot of those um, high cost areas, I would love us to get more affordable units in. And I know that we have to, we have to juice the support and incentives and speed to make that happen precisely because in a lot of my district land value is so high and people are trying to do other things with it. So thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Councilor Braden. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm trying to Following on from uh, Councillor Box mentioning of the affirmatively furthering fair housing, I think in, in, in Alston Brighton and, and neighbourhoods like Mission Hill and now increasingly in, in East Boston, we're seeing displacement of folks because our institutions aren't building enough on campus housing. And I don't know where, I think this is, there's many, many aspects to this whole problem of affordability in the city, but the fact that we have 153,000 students uh, definitely puts a lot of heat into our housing market. Um, but I think the one thing that's frustrating for us in Alston Brighton is that developers uh, focus on that market of the young professionals and the student population and they build a lot of housing that's studios and one bedrooms and they're not building family size units and they're not building and they're not thinking about planning and developing housing that's friendly for amenities for families and retirees and intergenerational families so that folks, families can actually stay in our, in our city. And I think we're what, right up there with San Francisco for the least number of children in our, in our neighborhoods in our city. So I really feel that the conversation about uh, affordability and, and incentivizing affordability, uh, the, the piece about family housing is really critical. And, um, you know, I had people laugh at us a few years ago at, at meetings, development review meetings, and saying, what, what are you, you could build some family housing, and they just, just looked at us like we were crazy. But I, I'm very, very happy that we have affirmatively furthering fair housing and zoning. I think that's a tool that we need to leverage more um, and make it, uh, make it that it's not, not possible to just uh, discriminate against families in our in our policy. So uh, I think really it's more of a statement than a question, but I think there's a lot of work to do on, on that area. Thank you. Thank you, Council Braden. Council Coletta. Thank you, Chair. 
still blinking. Oh, there we go. Hi. Um, I just want to underscore the, uh, the AFFH comment by uh, Councillor Bach. I think it's incredibly powerful. Uh, she used the word muscular, which is <laughs> very, um, uh, it's just correct in, in the way in which that we can move about um, uh, our regulations. So I just want to underscore that and uh, the family housing comment made by Councillor Braden. Um, I would, I, I guess we're not doing questions right now, so what I'll do is just encourage um, all of you on, on two different points. So the coordinated tracking system, I've heard from, from folks when it comes to at least the Zoning Board of Appeals, a lack of transparency and the inability to just get data. So if this coordinated tracking system can be made available to the public, I would uh, certainly appreciate that. That way, you know, folks, they're, they're always coming to our office and we do the best that we can, but if they can just get it online, I think that would be incredible. Uh, and then the other thing too, and what I'm seeing in District 1 is that, you know, for example, for 135 Bremen Street, or you know, I think there was another um, another project. It was the Mount Carmel um, project. They're coming back to the BPDA for approvals because they've changed their plans. And so I would like to see them subjected maybe to this new executive order or whatever we do. Um, I have already asked them to uh, abide by the updated linkage. They kind of scoffed at me at that idea. Like, we've already gone through the approvals process. We've already gone through the community process. And so we don't need to give extra linkage. And they were approved in 2014. And I just think it's absolutely ridiculous. So if we can incentivize them through this to produce more affordability, I think that would be incredible also. So thank you. You're good? What's up? Council Lauer. Thank you, Chair, and thank you all of you for being here with us today. Uh, I know that I only have two minutes, so I have three things. The first thing is that as the Housing and Community Development Chair, I filed a hearing order to have a conversation regarding Boston's inclusionary development policy. One of the things that we know is that our AMI is inclusive of, if, and I believe if I have this number correctly, 114 surrounding cities and towns. And we cannot change the AMI or how we, um, we can't change how we calculate the AMI, but we can change our definition of what affordable is in the city of Boston. I held the hearing because Mayor Wu made a campaign promise that she would be making changes to both the IDP and the AMI. And we've had conversations and I know that you have had internal delays based on, you know, the, the consultant that you hired to kind of go through the study but it's November and I have been incredibly patient and it is unacceptable that we have not made any changes. We have already gone through studies that show that we can go below the nine unit threshold and I think that that should have been acted upon and so I just wanna go on the record to say that we are waiting and I am not waiting patiently any longer. I'm, I'm kind of, you know, wanting to speed up the process and figure out what the mayor's gonna do. Um, Two things, I think that one of the, you know, we, you have made the comment about the acquisition opportunity program, particularly around transit corridors. And so we are having our special protection zones hearings on December 13th and you'll receive official invitation. But I think what we're looking at is that there are things that we already have. There are things that we already do. And what I'm looking is to bring those together and talk about how we codify those and protect the places that are most deeply impacted by displacement, which are transit corridors in the city. And so that, you know, will obviously I will send that in a formal request, but I just wanted to, to make that comment um, specifically about the, the special protection zones. Um, that is what I hope like that is gonna be my focus. We're gonna have this hearing early in the year, really looking at how do we codify protecting people from displacement in transit corridors, um, incentivizing affordable housing in transit corridors and especially in um, climate resilient locations and making sure that people can stay. And I think that to the Councillor Box point about home ownership and Councillor Anderson's point that we can't go lower when it comes to Home, like home ownership projects specifically because we can't get people to finance to our people if they're um, significantly below the AMI is that we have to think about creating a really robust and sustainable financing ecosystem in the city that includes public banking. And so we'll also be looking at what, what do we need in the city of Boston to make sure that people can thrive and have access to these um, home ownership opportunities as well. Thank you, Chair, that's all. Thank you. And uh, I would like to just add to the chorus, co-ops, Let's, let's plan a couple co-ops and see if anyone buys in on them. I think it would be a nice way for, for especially young people to be able to grow up with mentorship around them. And I think it 
might lead to a, a good model. Joel, you and I had talked about co-ops quite often. We need to help people to be able to get into these units. You need a PhD in, in, just, in just filling out paperwork to be able to get on these housing lists, full-time job, and um, something that Council from District 7 had spoke about quite often, and I've thought about it in terms of um, people aging out of their homes. We're unable to put the people that, that, that made their entire lives in a certain neighborhood, whether if it's Roxbury, Dorchester, or, or whatever, we're unable to keep them in those neighborhoods by build, it, like, we can't build an, an affordable senior home and know that Mrs. Whoever's gonna get, it, get in there and then sell her home to a, to a, um, a, a young couple that's gonna sort of regenerate the neighborhood. So those are some of my issues that I have. I know they're unsolvable, unsolvable prob probably. Uh, the, the Boston, the Boston um, preference doesn't seem to really work, and, um, but those are just some of my thoughts. Thank you guys for coming out here, and we do have an, another, another panel coming up. You guys are welcome to stay and listen if you want. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Is this guy Jesse? Yes. <laughs> How are you gentlemen today? All right, Mr. Chair. But good, I'll just turn it over to you if you can just tell us who you are and, and you know, statements, whatever you have, and then we'll open it up to questions. Whoever wants to start, I have no preference. Um, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. My name is Josh Zakem. I'm the Executive Director of Housing Forward Massachusetts. I uh, want to thank you. Uh, your colleagues and, and the sponsor, Councillor Bach, uh, for holding this hearing, for inviting us uh, to talk about uh, affordable housing um, and zoning reform in the city of Boston. Uh, housing Forward Massachusetts is an organization dedicated to advocating for policies, uh, largely within the control of uh, cities and towns that will accelerate the pace of, of housing production. Uh, affordable, middle-income, market-rate housing, uh, policy changes that, as we've just heard, are often at zero cost uh, to cities and towns, and that will increase the production of housing, create, increasing the supply, and ultimately lowering the cost. So to talk specifically uh, about the executive order uh, for affordable housing, I would like to say they are all great changes, um, applauded you know, across the board, very consistent uh, with Councillor Bach's uh, order from a year, year and a half ago, and I would say even before then with the Housing Forward Massachusetts blueprint uh, for Boston's next mayor that we released earlier um, in the summer of 2021. Um, it's really exciting. Implementation, though, is obviously incredibly important. So hearings like this, I think, are very important to hold folks' feet to the fire, so to speak, to make sure what we're talking about is actually being implemented. You know, creating predictability for builders uh, of both affordable and market rate housing uh, is incredibly important. Uh, you know, as the mayor's executive order laid out for affordable housing, the review process is almost a year on average. And, count, and Mr. Chair, as you mentioned, some are far longer. I don't know of any that are shorter. So I guess there must though, if that's the average. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a long time, cost goes up, um, and we need to address that. And as we've also heard many times in this chamber and out in the city in the neighborhoods, and there is a housing crisis in the city of Boston. But I think what we also uh, need to mention and need to talk about, though, is that there really, in many ways, are two housing crises in the city and across the Commonwealth. One is the lack of low-income housing. And I believe uh, Councilor Fernandez Anderson was talking really uh, effectively about that. When we talk about affordable housing at what AMI level is really important. There's also the crisis in middle-income housing which is often what when we're talking about 80% or 100% of AMI uh, is what's being addressed. And there are different solutions for each of these crises, but I do think this affordable housing executive order and the policies that have been talked about so far today will go a long way in addressing that. Um, you know, we, uh, I'll try not to go on too long because there was a lot, you know, 
while it was, we, we had a, a, the first panel was on for a while, it was really interesting and we got really deep into this. So I have a lot to, to add, but I'll, be, I'll just wrap it up with saying, at least the opening, with saying that increasing the speed of review and predictability for folks is going to be incredibly important for the city of Boston. Construction costs, financing costs uh, are rising. People are abandoning projects, both affordable and market rate. You know, the hard work, and you know, what Jesse will probably talk about a little bit, um, that many of us in this room did around uh, parking minimums for affordable housing that could lead to delays um, is really incredibly important. So I, I have some specific suggestions I'll make maybe further on after this opening comment on how to increase and accelerate housing production. But in general, roundly applauded changes. Um, look forward to seeing the implementation and make sure that we continue to create more affordable housing and housing of all types to, you know, fuel this growing city. People still want to come to Boston, which is exciting. We need to build enough housing uh, for all of them. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Councilors, my name is Jesse Kansen Beninov. I live in District 6. I'm a former uh, CDC affordable housing developer, and I'm currently executive director at Abundant Housing Massachusetts. At Abundant Housing, we're a Boston-based statewide coalition of pro-housing advocates and organizations working to build a better Massachusetts with affordable homes for everyone. A, a bulk of our energy is directed to communities outside of Boston as we work to overcome suburban exclusionary zoning and spread the responsibility for building the affordable homes needed by current and, and future Massachusetts residents uh, throughout the region. But our single largest base of members come from the city of Boston and we're committed to working for zoning reforms that build a more affordable, inclusive, and accessible Boston for everyone. Uh, I want to thank Councillor Bach for uh, submitting uh, this hearing uh, order and for initiating this really important conversation about how we can uh, more affordably um, and efficiently build the affordable homes that low and moderate income Bostonians so desperately need. Thank you, Councillor uh, Baker, for hosting the hearing today. And I also want to thank Mayor Wu uh, and her administration for their commitment to expanding housing affordability in Boston in a recent executive order to expedite permitting for new affordable homes in the city and explore other zoning changes to increase that affordable housing production. Abundant Housing Massachusetts stands in full support of targeted zoning relief for uh, new affordable housing development in Boston. We were proud to work with Councillor Bach, former Councillor O'Malley, uh, in the last council term to eliminate the costly parking mandates uh, to make it more uh, cost effective to build affordable housing in Boston. And thank you to Mayor Wu for signing uh, that into law last December. But parking relief alone is not enough. As the hearing order on today's agenda states, there remains a great need to explore the many other potential options for reasonable zoning relief for affordable housing development, including an affordable housing zoning overlay, such as those recently taken up in the cities of Cambridge and Somerville. Uh, the Cambridge members of our network, Abundant Housing Massachusetts, were instrumental in advocating for and winning a citywide affordable housing overlay, or what I abbreviate as AHO, in Cambridge in 2020. Uh, that zoning overlay, which permits greater height and more homes in affordable housing versus market rate housing development, has proven incredibly effective. Uh, while I know Cambridge City Councilors are actually currently looking at expanding those allowances even further, uh, given the success that they've seen, since it was first adopted, in, um, uh, since it was first adopted, uh, the Cambridge Affordable Housing Overlay has led to the emergence of nearly 400 new affordable homes in Cambridge's development pipeline. To put that in scale of Boston. Um, that would be uh, sort of the equivalent of 2,300 new affordable homes uh, in Boston in that short period of time. Uh, this includes buildings of various sizes and locations across the entire city of Cambridge, recognizing that Cambridge is, of course, a smaller city than Boston, um, but really recognizing the importance of doing this in every neighborhood uh, across the city. And this new affordable pipeline in Cambridge does actually contrast the city's inclusionary zoning ordinance um, under which the number of affordable homes unfortunately seems to have dropped precipitously since it was raised to 20% in 2017. So we're seeing more affordable housing come in the pipeline. Uh, as critical as it is to make sure the IDP works in Boston, uh, we see in Cambridge that a citywide affordable housing overlay uh, seems to be more effective. 
I'm grateful to be living in Boston where our commitment to affordable housing manifests in many ways, from our many strong CDCs to the historic commitment by this council and the mayor to investing in affordable housing production and preservation, and to the fact that we're even having this conversation today. Uh, but just as the market alone won't solve the housing crisis for our lowest income neighbors, greater funding and zoning relief for affordable housing alone won't fix our broken zoning system that makes housing out of reach for the middle class as well. We need to build more naturally occurring affordable homes for people that may not be income eligible for affordable housing, but can't afford the very expensive homes built in much of the city today. We can do this in tandem with zoning relief for affordable housing by adopting, zoning, uh, by adopting reforms to fil facilitate the construction of more missing middle homes uh, across the city. Uh, Boston has a revered history of building small apartments to house its working class residents, so there's precedent to allow smaller apartments, three to six units for instance, um, by right in every neighborhood of the city. I have a number of uh, proposed policy uh, interventions we, we can get into. I'm also um, you know, happy to share them at another time, but I don't want to take uh, you know, too much time in my opening statement, but I'm happy to get into them. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pass it to Council Blanc. Uh, thank you, and thank you both so much for being here. Um, I actually would love to just ask you each to expand a little bit on those concrete recommendations. I think that one of the reasons we wanted to hold the hearing is because we know that the administration is actively trying to figure out kind of what this should turn into, the executive order, and so want to get as many things on the table as possible. Yep. I'll, I'll do some quick bullet points and happy to answer questions. So, uh, eliminating parking minimums, which I think <laughs> we both agree on. Um, you know, more as of right building um, in every neighborhood. Obviously with some, you know, dimensional restrictions, I don't think you can fit, you know, a six or an eight unit building, you know, on a hundred square feet, but where it fits, you know, at least three units should be as of right. I hear over and over again from, you know, small folk, for small developers, excuse me, and builders who are trying to do that. And they say, yes, I can make some money building a three family house, but not enough that I can go through a year and a half of permitting and paying architects and lawyers and neighborhood reviews. So three family at a minimum, I think in many neighborhoods even more should be as of right. Um, looking at making sure, you know, another potential intervention would be looking at folks who are exceeding the inclusionary development policy requirements while not meeting maybe the 60% affordability of the mayor's executive order should have some expedited reviews maybe not necessarily a density bonus, but I would look at density bonuses, of course, as well. And I would also look at uh, Chapter 40R under the Mass General Laws, which is a way to, uh, there, I believe there's only one 40R district uh, in Boston right now. I don't know if, uh, see, Devin's not, I, I knew he would know exactly. Um, and sorry, and over there, Joel, I should guess on both sides. Um, but what's important about 40R is it gives direct reimbursement to cities and towns for zoning under 40R, based on number of units and then how many units are built, the city or town gets actual reimbursement as well from the state. Those are just a few quick ones. I know Jesse probably has some more. Yeah, I mean, I would um, definitely echo uh, everything that Josh just said. Uh, you know, some other ideas are, you know, in, in some ways very similar. Um, we really need to consider the appropriate level of residential den density that can be allowed by right, either uniform across the city or in consideration of existing conditions. I would also include uh, making sure we uh, have the right to do accessory dwelling units uh, by right across the city. But the point I want to make there is that, you know, absolutely around allowing, you know, a triple decker or a three decker or, a, you know, a four unit, maybe up to six units by right in some neighborhoods makes a lot of sense and, and, and fits in those neighborhoods. But just saying, oh, and, you know, uh, downtown or, you know, perhaps in the Fenway, you can build, a, you know, a three unit building, that's not actually going to necessarily happen or, or help. So we need to consider the overall density um, that we would like to allow by right in different neighborhoods considering current conditions. I would also say we need to reform and streamline the design review process, uh, you know, very specifically substitute objective frameworks for subjective and often overlapping design review processes um, that, you know, fantastic uh, staff do within uh, city agencies and, you know, I believe the time spent on design review by staff could be better utilized in, in other areas. 
uh, eliminate parking minimums uh, for new housing construction uh, citywide uh, to reduce uh, the ultimate cost of renting or purchasing uh, um, uh, new homes. This is something that I know uh, Mayor Wu and a number of councillors uh, indicated their support for during the 2021 City Council campaign. So I'd like to see that move forward. It really will help make housing more affordable, uh, in particular for you know affordable and middle income. Of course, we already did it for affordable housing. Um, uh, ensuring repairs to, this was talked about a little bit in the previous panel, but ensuring repairs to existing structures uh, can happen by right um, so that we can either preserve existing uh, housing, help convert it to, to, to more affordable housing, or even expand the number of units uh, in, internally um, without excessive cost uh, or process behind it. And then finally, it's a little bit off uh, you know, the track here, but I would encourage the uh, council to hold a hearing on Mayor Wu's appointments uh, to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Thanks. Um, I'm happy, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair, to let colleagues come back. Yeah, 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 exactly. Councilor Braden. Um, I don't have any any questions at this time. Councilor Lara. Thank you, Chair, and and thank you um, for being here with us today. <coughs> I have a few questions. You mentioned abandoning abandoned projects. Can you share a little bit more about that? Sure. You said people are yes. abandoning projects. I yeah, I, I think. This is, you know, happening across the board is that in some cases, even folks who have been permitted because of construction costs and financing costs, um, or you see fewer units being built because of construction costs and financing costs that have gone up dramatically. And obviously those costs are out of the control of, some would argue, anyone on the planet, but um, certainly those of us in this room. But it's the speed, it's, it's the predictability. So I do think the executive order with the goal of cutting in half the timeline for approvals will give folks that predictability. So if they've budgeted out, you know, a $10 million project that's gonna get them, you know, say 20, 25 units based on XYZ cost, it's gonna be much more in line with after that six month, hopefully permitting versus the year permitting, costs will be similar. So that's, that's been a lot of what, uh, what I've seen anecdotally. Um, there certainly is data around it as well, but what I would say is I hear over and over again folks who are saying, I gotta take a break. I can't look at this project or that project right now because of those costs and because I don't know if it's gonna take me 12 months or 24 months or 36 months uh, to get this project approved. Thank you, I appreciate that and clarification in, um, in terms of what you were referencing. My next question was, I think you've already answered it outside of the necessary complete overhaul of our zoning code, <laughs> what specific zoning interventions uh, do you think would be most effective? And I think that you've both laid those out unless you have any more that you wanna add to the list. Okay. Um, how do you think that we can use the zoning code as a tool to further the creation of the 15 minute neighborhood? Um, yeah, well, I think one, you know, I would encourage, um, you know, uh, members of the committee to, and the council to, uh, uh, you know, look at the, the concept of, of missing middle housing. This is a general term um, that's sometimes hard to uh, define, but it really refers to housing types um, that were much more common uh, before the, uh, you know, sort of development of sprawling suburbs, in, in, you know, around World War II, um, which we're very familiar with here in Boston um, with the, the, the three-decker home. Um, and, you know, I think zoning uh, changes that allow smaller apartment buildings uh, near transit or, you know, uh, or, you know, uh, what we might call village centers, think, you know, you know Center Street uh, within uh, District 6, uh, both in Jamaica Plain and, and West Roxbury, uh, places where we can concentrate that type of development and prioritize that type of development. That type of development can be less costly to build. Uh, it is type of development uh, that smaller developers and contractors, including potentially um, uh, builders of color who are trying to get into the industry and don't have the opportunity to work on larger scale development, have more access to. Uh, and so I think concentrating and, and prioritizing, again, smaller buildings near transit and, 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 and walkable, um, you know, sort of village centers is a great way to do that. And, and, if, Thank you. and if I could add, I agree with everything that Jesse said. Um, I will use a, a couple examples, you know, and I would say in, in an area I'm familiar with in, in Council Box District. Um, you know, you have a lot of five and six story buildings. Mm -hmm. um, 
and they're not necessarily around village centers, although I mean, not some of our downtown neighborhoods are, are very much like village centers. But I think that's really important, and there, there can't be this sort of immediate you know, opposition to height, even if yeah. it's an area that hasn't had that height. I'm not talking about a skyscraper, mm -hmm. but five or six stories, because this city is growing, but it's also growing in a way that, you know, for better or for worse, this is the fact, people are having smaller household sizes. Mm -hmm. um, and you look at the demographics and there's a host of reasons for that. But the fact of the matter is, if we're gonna reach a goal of, I believe the mayor said 800,000 residents in the city again, it's not gonna be, you're gonna need more units than the city did last time we had 800,000 residents. Mm -hmm. I think that's important. Yeah. Another aspect of 15 minute neighborhoods is if we want them to be equitable, and accessible to everyone, because you'll see people want to live in 15 minute walkable neighborhoods, it's very desirable. The city and state and federal government ideally is gonna have to cut out the checkbook and subsidize some of those very low income mm -hmm. housing. So while this affordable housing executive order that we're talking about today is really important to go back to the conversation earlier about what AMI level makes sense and my, my sort of framing of the two housing crises and that through this regulatory reform, I do believe we can solve it for middle income and missing middle, but we're also gonna need to say, if we're gonna have you know, a unit that's available for someone who's making 20% of AMI, whether it's for purchase or rent, it's, there has to be a, there's gonna have to be a subsidy there mm -hmm. at some level, um, you know, and cut out the checkbook, I guess. Thank you. One of the things in Jackson Square specifically that makes it a really effective 15 minute neighborhood is that there's also mixed use zoning. So Absolutely. you have commercial and then housing yeah. on top. And one of the concerns in West Roxbury, for example, the, you know, the, the project that I referenced earlier yeah. today is that this, this uh, building that this developer was trying to build here was in the middle of a commercial zone. It was mm -hmm. on the Center Street, Main Street, yep. and would effectively create a dead zone, right? Like a commercial dead zone if you just put a building there without any commercial. And so I really like the way that mixed use yes. looks. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> in terms of character of a neighborhood when you have, and so, um, but you didn't mention it, so I just wanted to bring it up. Do you think that that's also something that would be useful? Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, I think having the mix of uses is critical for walkable 50 minute neighborhoods. I will say that the Cambridge affordable housing overlay does consider that. And while I can't quote it verbatim, I believe there's a recommendation, if not requirement, that on uh, commercial corridors in Cambridge, so think, you know, Mass Ave, for instance, um, if you are doing a project under the AHO, you need to do ground floor retail. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happy to get more information on that and pulling it out of my deep memory here, but um, something, something to consider. Thank you. And going back to the um, affordable housing overlay in Cambridge, you mentioned earlier that you thought it was more effective. I mean, just for the record, how are you measuring effectiveness? Is it solely just based on the amount of units that they've been able to build? Uh, yeah, looking at the number of units, you know, I do think IDP, or as they call it in Cambridge, inclusionary zoning, is, mm -hmm. is a critical policy. I, I, mm -hmm. I serve on the mayor's um, you know, technical advisory committee for that, uh, and you know, look forward to the policy recommendations coming out of that. Um, but I'm looking at pure units, again, approximately 400 units in the pipeline in two years. Mm -hmm. um, there's been, within the neighborhoods in Cambridge, under their 20% inclusionary, there's been almost uh, single digits of units built under that, that policy. Most of them are happening in the large, you know, mm -hmm. multinational, well-capitalized developer projects, like either in Alewife or, um, or uh, uh, what's it called, North Point, Cambridge Crossing, near Somerville. Thank you, Chair. That's all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Council Bach. <clears throat> um, uh, well, one thing I wanted to pick up on was just that point about uh, about the mixed use neighborhoods. I think, you know, I think it's always worth registering the fact that there is this history in our country of zoning as being a tool for racial and residential yes. segregation. And it's interesting when you look back at 100 years ago when zoning first started coming in, um, you know, lot size requirements and such and like single family zoning was very much designed often to keep black families out of neighborhoods because they did not have the wealth to um, pay for that kind of housing. But interestingly, the move to single use zones was often designed to keep immigrant families out of a neighborhood because there was a tradition of having a trade and having the, you know, the cost savings efficiency of having your shop downstairs and your housing upstairs. And so interestingly, like, a, a, I mean, 
it, it's a sad fact that in, in a lot of cities in America, the move to get rid of that, to make that not a possible use, was to basically make it too expensive for someone who happened to be a tailor, um, you know, or like a trade like that, to actually have their shop and their and their housing on the same site. So I do think um, I often think, you know. The, I represent, as folks know, some of the wealthiest neighborhoods in the city, which also, as Josh just alluded to, many of them are party wall, five to six stories, no parking on site, got to walk everywhere. And I think like it just underscores the fact that there are very human, um, like lovely housing forms that can better accommodate everybody. So, I just add on to what you said about the zoning, Councillor, is that it is not lost on me, and a lot of folks are always surprised to hear the timing of when municipal land use and zoning became so popular. It was right after the U.S. Supreme Court outlawed racial covenants in housing and forbidding those, uh, you know, sales to, in many cases, black families, Jewish families, um, and immigrants. And that's really important. Now, that is, and it's happening. It's often becoming. The effect of many of our zoning policies is very similar even today. Um, and I also just want to shout one thing out because we often talk, we're always talking about community input on zoning, as we should. Um, in a democracy, um, we should be having those folks' voices heard. But I also want to caution us to say it's not always the loudest voices that are representing the majority. You know, right at Boston University, they've done outstanding research on who shows up to many of these community meetings, whether it's here in City Hall, around the neighborhood, and what their opinions are. And even looking at some broader polling that was done um, outside of this academic study is, you know, people are asked, uh, over, people were asked, do you believe you need more housing? You know, there's affordable housing crisis, do you believe we need more housing in the city of Boston? It was like 68% or 72%, I think, said yes, we need more housing. Then they said, do you want more housing in your own neighborhood? And the numbers barely went down. It went from low 70s to high 60s. However, when the question was asked, have you in the last, I think it was the last year, but it might have been a longer period, went to a community meeting or any sort of meeting about a proposed housing development in your neighborhood, were you there? And the number of respondents there was in the low 20s. So I think, again, I just want to recognize that we absolutely should be having community meetings. We should be weighing that input, and in many cases it makes a project better, but also I think the vast majority of folks in this city understand that we need to build more housing uh, for our communities and to have healthy communities, to have those 15-minute neighborhoods and those mixed-use neighborhoods. Absolutely, and, and I always think also that, you know, the person who, the person in the city who, who can't find a place to stably live, they're, they're somebody who the public interest has to be prioritizing as well, and the reality is they may not be anchored in the neighborhood yet, but um, but we need to be uh, making a place for them. So thank you. Thank you, Council Block. Um, so a couple things, just a couple of statements. 15 minute neighborhoods all sound good. Come to Dorchester, like we're trying to build back our old business districts that we lost during the 70s and 80s and things like that. And it's difficult to get into business now. So to 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 build around that, I mean. Eddie was talking about, Council Flynn was talking about, you know, some of these places you kind of do need a car because there isn't, there isn't a place to buy an apple. There isn't, you know, we're trying to build that infrastructure. Um, so again, the, the one size fits all, the, the, the as of right three decker sort of stuff, I'm, I'm totally out on that. I mean, I, because my worst experiences as a, as a city councilor being here for, 11 years was that developer that showed up and he's oh it's going to be as of right okay so you get a terrible project you don't you, you know like build it as cheaply and quickly as you possibly can um, so that sort of talk makes me nervous you know and I do think I do think that as we talk about rezoning rezoning means the voice of the neighborhoods isn't necessarily going to be at the table because rezoning for the future means five-story buildings every place, and 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 you know, five-story is the norm now. I'm not necessarily opposed to that. I'm, you know me, Josh. Um, I've 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 tried to I've tried to shepherd 
development into my community because I think the density, that 15 minute neighborhood is where safety happens. The more eyes on the street, the better off everybody is. Um, but I thought we did a pretty good job with this hearing today. Thank you guys. And I'm really good to see you, Josh. Thank you. Um, and, and good to see you also. Are there any final statements, comments, concerns? Did you see, did you see Councilor nope. Murphy's here? Did you see Councilor Murphy's oh, here? Um, Council Murphy, we're winding up. Do you no, have? No, yeah, I won't keep you guys. Thank you. Sorry, I actually was meeting with Chinatown residents about housing. It was their biggest question, and they were walking me through the plan above the Hudson Street um, Library. So that was great to see. So sorry I'm late, but I will review the tape and just happy to catch the end of it. So you know I'm. I'm here for this, so thank you. Very we're much. happy to talk your ear off about this anytime, Councilor. I love it. Yes, thank you. Thank you. This this meeting is adjourned.